Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, it has happened to me those times when I've lost something and searched frantically for it. And then that experience of great relief and thankfulness when I have found it. A couple of times, and this is when our children were younger and it seemed when you went out of the house you took almost everything but the kitchen sink with that diaper bag. And so a couple of times it was that I left my purse at a restaurant. <laughs> and when you realize it, that is such a horrible feeling. So we're almost home and I realize I don't have my purse. And so we run back to get it and thankfully it's right where we left it. Now there was another time when I was balancing my checkbook and I realized that I forgot to register a deposit. And kids, this is before mobile banking, when you actually had to write things down and the, and the bank sent you a statement. And I, I knew things were getting tight as I was writing checks and paying bills, but not until I was balancing the checkbook did I find my error. And I even called the bank to make sure. And yippee! There was a deposit there that I had failed to record. So that was, that was nice. And as joyful as that was, however, I can't say that I called my friends or family late in the evening to tell them to rejoice with me because I found my purse, or, nor can I say that I threw a great big party costing more than that deposit amount that I found. No, that part has not happened to me. It seems a little over the top and extravagantly wasteful, I think, to do something like that. But those are, those are two examples that emphasize me as the one searching and finding. But you know, there's also the perspective of that which was lost and has now been found. Again, in my two examples, it was a purse and a checking account deposit. And let's face it, my purse and the deposit, they really didn't have feelings one way or the other about being found or being lost. They didn't have feelings at all. Similarly, in the parables, the lost sheep and the lost coin didn't have much to do with their being found after having been lost. Can't say that they were rejoicing except to some extent that lost sheep may have felt a little bit relieved. You know, when you're the one that's been found, then it sounds like a pretty good idea for someone to come looking for you. But what's missing here is that there is another parable in this gospel text that we didn't read. It's a parable about a man who had two sons. And the younger son had got himself so lost in so many ways by asking his father for his share of the inheritance, and he took it and he squandered it. And then trying to make his way back home, he's greeted and welcomed and embraced by his father with a lavish party to boot. It's over-the-top extravagance. To that son, being found was pretty significant. And we might remember also in that story that the older brother didn't want to join the celebration even though the father had invited him to join. The common thread, though, in those three parables, the lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost son, again, something was lost and something has been found, and there was much rejoicing. There was great rejoicing. So much rejoicing, in fact, that it includes everyone around. Everyone who wants to rejoice is invited to rejoice and even the angels in heaven rejoice. Jesus tells these parables after the Pharisees have criticized him for eating with tax collectors and sinners and for welcoming them. These tax collectors and sinners are the ones, the gospel tells us, who are drawing near to Jesus. They're, they're pressing in and drawing near to Jesus. And that's what seems to have the Pharisees upset in the gospel reading. The Pharisees have been the ones who've been with Jesus. They've been 
having him over to share a meal together. They've been debating their interpretations of the law, but now these tax collectors and sinners are drawing near to Jesus. And these tax collectors and sinners are being presumptuous, it seems, that they are butting in, if you will. And so the Pharisees grumble and mumble and, quite frankly, take offense. And Jesus hears them and tells them these parables. These parables, Jesus tells, are about being lost and being found. That's what Jesus is about. He is about looking for the lost one, seeking, searching, finding, saving the lost one and bringing the lost one back into the fold, and rejoicing then with the whole community, and not, not just those around. Jesus says even the angels in heaven are rejoicing before God every time someone who was lost has been found. This is the gospel truth, church. Every one of us has been saved by a grace that is unmerited, undeserved, unexpected. None of us, by what we do or don't do, can get ourselves saved. The shepherd was willing to risk the 99. He left them in the wilderness and risked losing them, willing to risk everything for the sake of the lost sheep, the one lost sheep. And that's exactly what God did through God's Son, Jesus Christ. God gave up Jesus, his only beloved Son, for the sake of the one, everyone, every lost one, every last one. And oh, the rejoicing in heaven when we realize and accept that we have been found. It is the joy of salvation. The Apostle Paul knows that joy. And in this letter to Timothy, it states the core of Jesus' mission and to the world. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. That's it. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Paul tells of his own experience that he himself is the chief of all sinners, having persecuted the first followers. But that doesn't stop God's mercy. It does not limit God's grace for him. He writes, I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief, and the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Again, that's what Jesus is all about. He's about looking for the lost one, finding the lost one, saving the lost one, and rejoicing with anyone who will rejoice with him. Once again, the lost sheep and the lost coin cannot repent. They cannot make themselves get found. So the point of the parables point us to God and what God does and what God is doing. And God searches and God finds and God saves and God calls the community, the whole community, the sinners and tax collectors and the Pharisees and the scribes to rejoice. He calls them all to rejoice at being found. He calls us to rejoice at being found. A pastor tells this story about a man who came to his office asking to be baptized. He says, Alan came to me when I was at my previous church wanting to be baptized. He was a child or a victim of the me decade. He felt compelled to leave home and family to find himself. But of course, he lost himself becoming a stranger to himself and to the world, wandering the streets of the city, trapped in a world of drugs. 
One night, he managed to get off the street for a night in one of the shelters. He crashed into the bunk, staring up at the ceiling, listening to the groans, trying not to be overcome by the odors of the strangers in the bunks around him. He didn't know where he was. For that matter, he didn't seem to know who he was anymore. And he wanted it to be over with. And he considered how he might take his own life. He was shaken out of his thoughts when someone came in and called out a name from another world. Is Alan Roberts here? That had been his name once, but he hadn't heard it for such a long time. He hardly knew Alan Roberts anymore. It couldn't be him they were calling. The caller persisted. Is there anyone named Alan Roberts here? No one else answered. So Alan took a risk. I'm Alan Roberts, or at least I used to be. Well, your mother's on the phone. My mother? No, can't be. You've made a mistake. I don't know where I am. How could my mother know where I am? If you're Alan Roberts, your mother's on the phone. Unsure what to expect, he went to the desk in the hall and took the receiver. Alan, it was his mother, it's time for you to come home. Mom, I don't know where I am. I have no money. You don't know what I'm like anymore. I can't come home. It's time for you to come home, she said. There's a Salvation Army officer who's coming to you with a plane ticket. He's going to take you to the airport to get you home. Now, she didn't know where he was. She just called every shelter and hostel for months until she found him. He went home and supported and loved by his mother, who had never ceased to know him, even though he had forgotten himself. And influenced and inspired by the faith that had sustained his mother's hope and love, he began, he began attending church services and one day came to my office then seeking to be baptized. Now, he did not find his own way into my office, a path not his own making, made by the love that found him, had led the way. A love that knew him better than he knew himself. A love that invited him to follow the one who brings us all home. Dear people, the role of the church is to join God in God's mission. The role of the church is to join God in seeking and searching for the lost. And if you know that you have been found by God, then rejoice. Rejoice, but also know that you have your assignment. And if you are the one who is lost, if you are the one who feels confused, or if you're the one who doesn't think God's grace and mercy can reach you, know this, that God's mercy is unending, that God will search and not rest until you are found and brought home to God's love. Because love's door is always open. And home, home is already waiting. Thanks be to God. Amen.